director of the University of California Global Health Institute. And we really appreciate your interest in and attendance at today's uh, webinar to talk about uh, NIH diversity supplements. You may have seen the announcement yesterday of uh, Francis Collins, uh, Director Francis Collins, Director of the NIH's uh, statement about NIH stands against structural racism in biomedical research. And I think this has been an important period of time ever since George Floyd's murder that where we realized the work that we have to do, the, the ongoing work that we have to do both with ourselves and with our institutions in order to address uh, structural racism. One way that we thought that we could address it is by promoting the NIH diversity supplements. And that's what today's webinar is about. We have a stellar panel of NIH program officers who will be talking to us and answering your questions. Uh, I think people are still joining. So maybe I'll just wait a second on the poll. Well, actually we could go ahead and do the poll, I guess and see who's joined us already. So we have a poll and we'd like you to respond to the poll. We may, we may um, actually also uh, uh, redo the poll. And what we would like to ask you to do is uh, just indicate which campus you're from so we can get a sense of where people are joining the webinar. See, we have somebody joining us from CSU Long Beach. Welcome, glad to have you have you join us. Um, and somebody from the University of Arizona. Uh, sorry, we didn't include your institutions. <laughs> we didn't realize we were going to have uh, people joining from so many different institutions. Linda, are you going to show us the result? Yes, uh, we have about seventy-five percent of participants who have entered their responses and sharing results now. Hey, Berkeley, Davis, Irvine, Los Angeles, Riverside, San Diego, and San Francisco. Great representation. Nice, nice mix of campuses up and down the coast. That's, that's awesome. Uh, we may try it again at the end to see if other people join us. And we also have, um, uh, we also have uh, people joining from other institutions as well. So uh, one of the uh, participants already uh, put up a question. So what we would like to ask you to do is in the Q&A function, Put your questions in there, and when we get to that uh, that segment uh, of the of the uh, uh, the Q and A period, we'll we'll go through and, and answer your questions. And then after the seminar, we're planning on putting up on our website uh, Q and A frequently asked questions, so that we can respond to all of your questions. So let me first. I'm very pleased to introduce our our speaker, Dr. Rob Rivers who is a program director at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive Diseases, NIDDK. Uh, and and uh, he leads the program there that helps ensure biomedical research workforce reflects the diversity of the population and addresses all health concerns. Rob, my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you, Tom. Um, and it's good to be with everyone. And I realize the purpose today is really not hearing me, but actually getting your questions answered. But before we get to answering those questions, we thought it'd be really worthwhile to just walk everyone through what is what are NIH diversity supplements, how you can apply to them, and what they can help support. So for the next five to seven minutes, I'm just going to walk through um, the program announcement 21071, diversity supplements. Like with all things in life, the first step is to review and read. So number one, read the program announcement. Number two, after you've reviewed and read it, 
contact the, your institute or center's program officer for the parent award in which the supplement will be provided. Step three, develop a compelling application. And then fourth, yeah, let's, let's make change happen and really go about diversifying the biomedical research workforce. In everything we do at NIH, we always wanna keep, we try to keep it simple, um, even though there's, there's tons of words in our program announcements. But before you start working on a supplement application, please, please, please just contact your program officer first, contact NIH before, for, before you write it. Because as you'll notice when you hear from the panel, each institute or center at the National Institutes of Health operates the diversity supplement program slightly differently. So it's best to find specific questions and get those answered before, before writing everything down. So basically, let's take a step back. So really, how does ID, NIH really work? Really, the goal is moving your really great ideas and inspirations to funding. Um, so you come up with a great idea. If it's, it's responsive to the request, in this case, diversity supplement, it comes to us. And what we're hoping to provide you today is answer some of this gray box of the question, what happens when it goes to NIH as a diversity supplement? And ensure that you have the happy face with funding as opposed to the not so happy face where it's reviewed but not awarded. So diversity supplements are administrative supplements to already existing NIH funded awards. And they can apply for individuals from the high school stage all the way to tenured faculty. The idea is really diversifying our workforce. And we try to do that by providing an opportunity for individuals who are underrepresented because minority or racial designations from disadvantaged groups or disabled individuals with the idea of bringing more people into the research enterprise. Because we know if more people are at the table and part of the research, the likelihood we're gonna come out with better solutions and more inclusive strategies to address the maladies and other health issues we're facing as a nation and truly the world. So who, who's eligible for a diversity supplement? Individuals have to be a US citizen or permanent resident and have to be from a population historically underrepresented. And notably in the, in the announcement in the PA, the guidelines allow institutions to describe how a certain person is underrepresented. And I often encourage, before you write the entire application, reach out to the program officer and the contact at the IC before moving forward. The third is no concurrent public health service support for the candidate. So the idea here is that if you're already funded on someone else's NIH award, we're not gonna take you off that NIH award and put you on a diversity supplement. Because the idea is expanding the workforce. We're not really interested in doing essentially a shell game where it's like, oh, I can get a diversity support here and then I can take this one person off my grant and then I can open that spot up for someone else. That's not our goal. And then when we're thinking about which grants are eligible for diversity supplements, as mentioned before, talk to your program officer at your IC, but almost most every grant with at least two years of su active support is are eligible for diversity supplements. And the difference between supplements and a typical grant that you submit to NIH is that supplements are reviewed internally. They're programmatically reviewed as opposed to peer review. So what that looks like at the National Institutes of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, NIDDK, is that we have a group of program officers that have portfolios and training, and they review, the major they review all the diversity supplements that come in. And as they review, they're looking at basically three major categories, the candidate, their motivations, accomplishments, the research plan, is the plan tangential to the already funded parent award? And what we're really, really, really focusing on in IDDK is the mentoring and career development plan. So how can we move candidate from where they're at in A to B, hopefully independent funding? And how can this supplement help them or her 
or the person to get there. And I, I can't harp, harp on this enough. The career development aspect is incredibly important. Will, is this career plan designed and personalized to the candidate? So if you're writing an application and you're just thinking, oh, at our institution X, we have program Y that provides great training for all candidates. Well, actually, that may not fare that well in most programmatic review because that's just basically a standard approach. What we're looking for in this career development is what specific skills will the candidate receive through this training that's gonna help their career move forward. So let's say someone's a bioinformaticist and they're looking to engage more in, 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 in biology. Well, if there's specific courses or specific research that will increase their molecular biology skills, that should be included in the career development plan. So addressing the specific areas or potential weaknesses, um, that's what we're looking for. Lastly, and how, how do you develop a really strong um, diversity supplement application? Use clear and concise language so it's easy for the reviewers to understand. Ask the, the million dollar question, why? So, so why, why this candidate? Why this research? And why now? The limitations in approach, responsiveness, and then the track the track record of publication history and training history for the mentor um, in, in that group. Notably, we're seeing a lot more applications coming in with teams of mentors. And we actually think that's at, at NIDDK, that's a positive development because we realize oftentimes if the mentoring is happening just from one individual, that's good. But if there's additional mentors that can provide key insights and guidance, that's even better. So just in thinking about how do you develop the strongest career and training plan, mentorship teams are often worthwhile. So I just wanna go back to the take home message before we move to the entire panel and move it back to, to, to Tom. Before you start, contact your NIH program officer. Literally, we work for you because your tax dollars pay for our jobs. So we will respond with the questions you have. Number two, read through the announcements carefully. Before you start writing, just read through it. Make sure you've got your questions answered, that this is actually something worthwhile. <laughs> Once again, contact us before you start. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it to Tom. Thanks, Rob. That was terrific. I really, really, really appreciate uh, that overview. Uh, let me introduce the, the other members of our panel. Uh, Dr. Gita Bansal is a program officer responsible for Fogarty, Fogarty International Center's HIV Research Training Program. Uh, and she has previously worked at the Division of AIDS Research at uh, NIAID. And then Dr. Shakira Nelson uh, is the, um, is, um, um, I'm looking in the wrong place. Uh, is Dr. Shakira Nelson is Director of Diversity Supplement Program for the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. So thank you to Gita and Shakira. Let me ask you, well, let me just make a comment first. One of the questions that came up was, what is an IC? And uh, maybe you could answer that question. And, uh, maybe we could all try to avoid um, acronyms <laughs> because not, not everybody shares the same acronym alphabet. So anyway, what we, maybe you could just tell us what an IC is. Who are you directing this to? Agita, why don't you answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, an IC stands for Institute, C stands for Center. So the NIH has 27 ICOs. There are also offices that um, uh, are special, you know, units that uh, uh, foster some specific areas. So, institutes, centers, and offices. And from my reading of the program announcement, uh, virtually all of the institutes and centers have diversity supplement programs. Isn't that uh, that correct? No. Yeah, I think so. Um, Gita, let me just ask you uh, another question. Uh, Anything that you would like to amplify on from Rob's uh, presentation? 
Yeah, I'm glad I went through the slide before because I kept getting pushed off of the video. But uh, uh, the only the thing that I would like to add is uh, Fogarty International Center, as the name suggests, we work in the lower and middle income countries. And so most of our programs, uh, most of our grants are actually uh, um, funded in, in, in those institutions. So when we talk about diversity supplements, uh, we have to, you know, you have to be careful about the applications coming in from US PIs and the diversity pool of, 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 of candidates will have to be from the US. So they have to be US citizens and US. So, and, and then you make sure with your institutes that, you know, you, you can get all the um, uh, paperwork or, or um, uh, attestation that you do belong to one of the classes of, you know, that's defined as diversity and so on in the in the FOA. Um, yeah. Great. So Thanks. this wouldn't, what we do, it wouldn't apply to a student or a trainee apply, you know, who is actually a citizen of a, um, another country. But you can work in the low and middle income country. And I do have uh, one, uh, one application like that, that apply, applied last year. It was a US PI on one of my programs, and she found a, um, a person that qualified to be, you know, in the diversity pool. But the whole, all the work is being done in, um, I believe it's Tanzania, but that's, that's how we work. Terrific. Shakira, let me ask you if anything you would like to amplify on. Hi, yes, can you can hear me? Yeah. All right, perfect. So I think one of the things that um, Rob mentioned uh, is something that we also highlight at NIGMS and that's um, really making sure you are putting a lot of effort into building a strong uh, research training plan and a career development plan. And I think those are very important to the success of your diversity supplement because it, it reflects the time and effort put into really building the students to help them get to the either the next step in their career path or the next step in their um, educational path. Um, and so having very strong uh, research training plans and career development plans, I think um, is something when I speak with potential candidates, something that I highlight. And I think it, and it sounds like uh, Rob and uh, Geetha also highlight that in their programs as well. Um, as something that's vitally important to the success of the application. The, um, I noticed that the diversity supplement RFA allows for applicants at a wide variety of levels, all the way from high school through graduate school, through undergraduate, graduate school, professional school, uh, postdocs, as well as junior faculty. Um, is there any preference at any of those levels or do you, uh, do you see applications at all of those levels and are are open to them? Um, I can answer that question first. So I, I will say that um, we don't have a preference for, for any level. Um, the applications that I've seen come through have been from all levels. Um, we might see more from graduate students or postdocs at any given time, but that's not due to a preference. I think that's just due to um, you know the, the school year and, and how things are going um, at the academic institute. Um, and I can say that things have been a little different in times of COVID as institutions are starting to open back up and uh, students are getting back to the lab and um, starting to, to pick work up again. So that has um, allowed us to see more applications come in for, you know, different levels. But no, in, you know, in terms of a preference, we, I, I don't, I would not say that we have a preference for any level. Um, Rob, one of the things that you mentioned and you, you emphasized over and over was talk to the program officer uh, at the particular institute. One of the things I did notice in the uh, program announcement is that each institute sort of has its own way of doing these and timeline and, and when they can be submitted. Um, and but what else what else can the program officer help you with? I, I think beyond getting the exact the timeline, I think when you're talking to the program officer is getting the sense what's what's the focus at that IC in terms of looking for the type of training, what the push is for, and what basically is there any secret sauce 
And typically there isn't, but it's always worthwhile to just go ahead and ask the questions like, hey, I have a candidate. Usually you want to send us a bio sketch of the candidate you're, you're, that's planning to be placed on the diversity supplement. And maybe a one page of aims, hey, in the two years of supplement, we're thinking about doing X, Y, and Z. And I think those two documents together sent to the program officer or for the, the, at that IC, at that institute or center at NIH that funds the current NIH award you have, I think sets up a really good conversation with the program officer, at least an email that says, this sounds and looks great, move forward and apply. Because essentially your program officer in most institutes or centers becomes the advocate for your supplement. Um, so you wanna make sure that your program officer is aware of what you're doing um, and, th and the plan that's being proposed. Uh, Gita, you mentioned that, um, that uh, you, you, you uh, support uh, applicants who, who are qualified, uh, qu qualify under the criteria to work in low and middle income countries as well. Um, if, if I have, a, say, if I have a grant from NIMH, can I come to the Fogarty Center for a diversity supplement to an NIMH grant? Uh, no, not really. Uh, each, okay. each of the institutes, you know, they have their own grantees that they would like to promote. Uh, and so the supplements, so if you have an NIMH grant, you should talk, because you're talking to the program officer, remember? And your program okay. officer will be in the institute where your grant is. So you wouldn't think of coming to uh, Fogarty or somebody else, unless um, there are co-funding institutions. So for example, I have another grant that we just awarded a, a few months ago that uh, NICHD co-funds with my program in, in Fogarty. And so they were willing to, um, and this, is, this doesn't apply to a diversity supplement, but it could. Um, they were willing to put in the money to award the supplement to the grant that resided in, in, in Fogarty, but they were co-funders, they were partners. And so it worked that uh, we could accept money for the supplement. So if you have no relationship, then it's difficult. You can't just you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. enter the door. But if you have a relationship by an active funded you know, grant, uh, funded by both institutes, then it's possible. Thank you, thank you. Um, Shakira, let me ask you a question. Um, so how serious is the NIH about these diversity supplements? Is, is there, uh, does, are, do the resources last the entire year? Are they unlimited? Are they fairly limited, or does it vary by institute? I, I hate to put you on the on the on the spot, but you know we when we when we apply for grants, we always like to say, mm, "What are my chances here?" <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I, I, that's a great question. So um, I can't say that I, I don't believe funds are unlimited, um, and um, <laughs> I, at least at least within NIGMS, um, and I, I would assume the same for for some of the other institutes and centers um, and offices. Um, when I get asked this question by potential applicants, I usually tell them that um, within NIGMS, we have, I'd say, a 60 to 90 percent success rate of the applications that come through. Um, and, and I also preface this by saying that, um, you know, if you apply earlier in the fiscal year, um, it, it, it could be better. Um, no. As opposed to applying later in the fiscal year where funds start to get low and we might have to, um, while we might approve the application, we might save it for the following, start of the following fiscal year when, when fresh funds come through. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's, it, it also varies. Um, it depends on the type of application you're putting in. If it's a high school versus a postdoc um, versus a grad student, the amount of monies that are awarded in each of those types of applications is going to differ. And of course, that's going to have an effect on how many funds are left over for the entire program. But, um, you know, bottom line, I would not say that funds are unlimited. Um, we see about 60 to 90% success rates. Right. Um, but, you know, regardless of, of when you need the supplement or of if you're thinking that there might be any funds, um, I always encourage everyone to apply anyway. Um, because again, even if we can't 
uh, support you within this fiscal year. If you have a strong application that we approve, we can shift you to the following fiscal year. And the federal federal fiscal year is um, October 1 to September 30th. Correct. So yes. get your application in on October 2nd. George. <laughs> Although so quite just, often the federal budget hasn't been passed by then, but early in, early in the year. Yeah, can I just add add to what RIC does uh, to that? Please. So we 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 uh, we uh, uh, want applicants. To, we 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 cannot aw uh, award throughout the year. We don't have Fogarty doesn't have too much money. We partner with other ICs, and that's how we we get a lot of work done. And so what we like to do is to get them in by June. And then there's those awards, all of them are reviewed together and then the awards are made towards the end of September before the new fiscal year starts. So we don't have a continuous. Um, so even if you apply, even if you submit something in, let's say in the fiscal year in November, that's very early, it'll still sit till, you know, May or June where we can take okay. a look at it. Okay. So if we all, you know, I guess we all differ in, in the way, uh, uh, you know, our funds are and, and how we we can um, act on them. I just wanted to show that. And, and, I mean, yeah. and I think one of the things that you've all emphasized, this is a fairly interactive yeah. process. So I, I'm assuming too that you'll you can review drafts and help them improve along the way. Do you do you actually do that for for applicants? So I, we do. We do try to make sure that they are um, responsive. You don't want, you know, you don't want mm -hmm. efforts to be wasted on all fronts, right? The writing part and the applicants part, as well as the reviewing and the stuff we have to do. And, and so um, I strongly encourage, and we, I think Rob mentioned that uh, umpteen million times, talk to the program officer, talk to the program officer. We all believe in that, that you should pick up the phone, find out who your program officer is. I think most of them know who they are, but sometimes I've you know, people don't even know who they are, especially if they are young people that have never worked with grants. Call the program officer, talk to them, and talk to them with the mentor or with the person that's going to be uh, uh, applying, your, your uh, you know, the person who holds the grant. You wouldn't want a high school student to just pick up the phone and talk because they wouldn't really understand a lot of things. So it's best to get them involved uh, with, the, with the mentors, with the, with the PIs. And, and, and I always encourage them to talk uh, uh, only because we, we feel that, you know, we don't have a lot of money. So we want to make sure that what comes in is going to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And we don't want them to apply and then, and then lose heart that, oh, Fogarty doesn't do anything. They cannot do anything. They're, they're poor. We don't want that kind. That's not what, you know, we really want to uh, encourage, but we want to put the best, you know, their best feet forward, so to speak. Uh, and so we'd like to work with them. Great, thank you, thank you, Gita. Um, uh, somebody asked in the in the chat if um, this is if the, the 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 recording is going to be posted. Yes, we are going to post the recording of this on our website, and we're also going to go through the questions that don't get answered and try to come up with frequently asked questions, asked questions, and, and some some succinct answers. And I see a lot of questions piling up. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, Sun Cotter. Sun is the director, deputy director of the UC Global Health Institute, and she will moderate the Q and A period. Sun, over to you. Thanks so much, Tom, and thank you, Rob and Shakira and Gita. What an amazing panel! And um, I've definitely been hearing the takeaway of like, don't be shy, contact your program officer and look at how, how approachable our NIH friends are here. So I do hope that, that <laughs> I see Rob, yeah, um, that that makes it easier for folks and not feel too intimidated to reach out. And we do have a bunch of awesome questions. So um, with that, I'm going to just kind of bounce around a little bit. Uh, let's see here. So um, let's see. Oh my gosh, there are lots of really good ones. There was a one. Okay, so what types of parent awards are eligible? For example, are K awards or smaller grants like R21 eligible? So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was I was gonna say that um, you know on the on the FOA it does list all the research activities that are eligible for diversity supplements. Yeah. Um, but even within that, you know, there are nuances for the different institutes and centers which of course, why would there not be um, nuances? But um, 
you know, uh, yeah, I would say the, the your first thing should be to to browse the the FOA um, to see if you find your research activity, and then if you're still not sure um, if it's eligible, then of course, as Rob mentioned many times, and as we've mentioned many times today, uh, reach out to the program officer um, and ask if if your grant is eligible. And I, I, I'm going to do it just this one time. I'm going to piggyback <laughs> on that answer because there's some questions that tie into it. Um, and there's a question, hey, you know, if I'm a junior faculty, should I have a senior person serve as a co-mentor? And that comes to some of that question if often sometimes people who are more junior might have that R21 or the R00 part of a K99 R00. And so typically, yeah, it's not a bad idea to have a team of mentors that that will help provide and support the candidate. My my one my like nugget of wisdom here is make sure that it's an authentic senior mentor that's helping in that mentor experience, and you're just not grafting on to someone who has a lot of NIH support in a training record, but has no connection to your research, has no connection to the candidate, and literally works on the other side of the campus. Mm -hmm. Like try to make it something that's connected to the work you're doing and connected to what the candidate's longer term goals are, that's when it's a valuable incorporation of outside mentors or more senior mentors. But just putting a senior person because they're a senior person who has funding from that IC, but there's no connection and they throw in an old bio sketch, that does more harm than good. Yeah, I, I'd also like to emphasize yeah. what Rob said about, uh, you know, making sure that if you do bring on a co-mentor or a team of co-mentors, that they also play a role in the development of the research training plan and the career development plan um, and, and are part of the mentor and or the mentorship. Um, like, you know, like you said, it's not enough just to have a, a big name on there, but we want to see them take part in the development of the student because that is the main goal of the diversity supplements is really building up students to help contribute, um, you know, to the biomedical workforce and to, to do great things. And um, so we want to make sure that that's in there as well. So may I just add one more thing to all this? Uh, what Rob and, and Shakira said, totally, totally important. But the thing that to remember is even to take the mentors, remember that this is a supplement to an already existing grant. And that already existing grant has certain goals and certain scientific you know, work that they uh, promise to do. So whoever is coming in for the supplement, it's obviously going to go through the PI of that grant. It needs to be within scope. To, I, and I think all I see is work that because it's there in the FOA. You cannot just bring in some totally you know, unconnected work and then and just try to attach it. It has to flow in with the specific aims you know, it, it has to be related. You know, it cannot, it doesn't have to be exactly the same aims or you take aim three and, 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 and write a supplement. That's not what it is. It's things that are shooting off of those, of that work that was contemplated in the original one. So remember that, you know, this is another important thing that you have to remember is that the supplement should be in scope with the, you know, um, the, the the parent grant. The parent grant is the one that is you're going to attach it to. That's very important. That's the first thing we look at when we start reviewing. Is it within the scope? Right, guys? Absolutely. And Shakira, yes. yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, so for this question, it's easy to conceptualize a project for a graduate student or postdoc. It is more difficult to conceptualize a project for a high schooler or an undergrad student. I can think of a training plan to fold them into our research work, but it's harder to think of a unique research project. Do you have advice on how to proceed with younger and less experienced applicants? I have an answer that's very NIDDK specific. <laughs> so we actually have a summer research program called Step Up, which is for high schoolers um, that would qualify for diversity supplements. That same group, that same group of people are eligible for Step Up. And if you're mentoring a high school student, we actually tell our NIDDK researchers, tell that student to apply to step up and say they want to work in your lab. And that way, it's, it's, a, it's a faster process. It's an easier process. And really, the training that you're providing is more general versus when you're looking at diversity supplement, we're getting, we're getting it into the weeds of, well, are they going to be learning how to do the Western blot very well? Or are they going to be able to do RNA-seq by the end of this? 
versus a summer research opportunity or experience is more being in the lab, sharing that opportunity. So we accept high school applications at DK, but we really encourage folks to go via our summer research program that's designed to simplify the process, both for investigators and for the high school student. Yeah, and I, I will say, um, you know, within NIGMS, when I am approached by or contacted by PIs who are interested in funding uh, or doing a supplement for high school students, um, my first piece of advice for them is to, you know, make sure they're, they have an understanding of what the high school student is looking to get out of their experience. Um, it might not be specifically to learn how to do Western blots or how to do RNA-seq or, or anything like that. They might be looking for a little bit more of a broad experience of being in the lab, um, being able to learn from undergraduates or graduate students um, and building that repertoire and those relationships to see if pursuing something in the sciences is what they would like to do as they're looking at colleges to apply to and going into their next steps. So I, I think it's important, especially for, for high school students to understand that it, it isn't always necessarily science focused. Um, it's also about um, building their interest in science, building their relationships and their networking and helping them make the decision of what they want to do next, um, which is hopefully to pursue an undergraduate degree in the sciences and, and hopefully after that, a, a graduate or medical degree. Yeah, and the FOA really outlines all the various different ways uh, that you can use to apply for supplements, you know for all the different categories of um, applicants. So I think reading through the FOA with a red marker and a pink marker and a green marker and writing, you know, making sure that you have all the uh, important um, uh, criteria in front of you as you are thinking of approaching your program officer for questions, make sure that you have done that and you are asking the right questions of the program officer by first reading through the FOA. Thank you. And this next question, in this time of COVID-19, has the amount of funding for diversity supplements changed? So for, for me, I've actually only been at NIGMS for about four months now, so I don't have um, a comparison point. Um, but I can say it doesn't seem like we've had much of an adjustment made specifically for the diversity supplements. Um, I think, and I mentioned this a little earlier, I think as things start to shift back to opening and, and, and moving ahead past where we've been with the, with the pandemic, um, we are starting to see a little bit of an uptick in the number of applications for supplements, but I, I can't necessarily say that we've seen positive or negative changes to the, to the overall budget as a result of COVID. Thank you, Shakira. And the next question is, what are some of the key considerations for a career development plan? Anyone? R Rob? Uh, I, I will say quickly um, that one of the keys that I look for is, um, especially for uh, graduate students and, and, and actually for postdocs as well is, a utilization of the individual development plan, um, IDP. And uh, I encourage use of this as a way to identify both the strengths and weaknesses of the student um, that's going to help them achieve whatever their next career and educational goals are. And I think completion of an IDP is imperative for both the student to realize what they need and for the mentor to realize what the student needs and then build a strong development plan from that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm throwing back up the slide about supplement, supplement application review, just to get into some of the, the weeds of it. And I think we're correct in saying some that we'll, we can send these slides out as a PDF to all the participants. Yep, Is that fine? Definitely. Yeah, so everyone will have a copy of this. And so as Shakira said, an IDP is critical and key in ensuring that you're setting up really quote unquote smart goals. So they're specific, measurable, attainable, and really 
the, this is going to address some questions I've seen in the in the Q and A as well. If you're planning to apply, especially if you're a graduate student or a postdoc, the way you should envision these diversity supplements as a bridge or as an on ramp into your pathway through the biomedical research workforce. So a training plan that's providing you with preliminary data to publish a paper and to apply for F31 if a grad student, and then also enough timing so you can submit the first application. And oftentimes that first application isn't funded for an F31, but you get enough time that you can revise it and submit the next, the, what we call the A1 or the, um, the revised application. That's kind of the time frame and the type of career planning that we really like seeing at NIDDK because it's a proactive approach that allows for the candidate to move forward um, in their own professional and scientific development and hopefully with their own independent funding. Um, Son, if I might, could I ask a, a couple of questions? Yes, definitely. So uh, some of the questions have to do with what is considered underrepresented. Um, one question about uh, female trainees, are they considered underrepresented? Another question about LGBTQ uh, trainees, are they considered underrepresented? Uh, maybe you could address that. Uh, Shakira, maybe I'll throw that to you first. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So in the FOA, and I'm actually going to bring it up as quickly as possible. Where are we? There it goes. In the FOA, um, we kind of do list uh, the groups that are considered that are considered underrepresented minorities, um, and I believe we base this off of um, National Science Foundation. I'm trying to find the, the right language. I don't want to botch this. Um, Hi, Shakira, do you want me to share the NIH notice on the interest of diversity? Yes, please. Yeah, that's, I think that's what I was, yep, that's exactly what I was going for. Um, and so, yes, this is included in the FOA um, to help with questions such as these. Um, and so, as you can see, um, when it comes to identifying underrepresented minorities, um, if you look uh where it says, A, individuals from racial and ethnic groups that have been shown by the National Science Foundation to be underrepresented. Uh, we have language for that. And we also have language for individuals with disabilities and also individuals with uh, of, or from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, for the question about um, female scientists, um, I believe uh, at the postdoctoral graduate and, and graduate level, female scientists are not considered underrepresented, but they're more considered underrepresented in the upper echelons of um, academic, uh, academic areas in terms of you know, tenure track um, professors. Is that, is that correct, Rob and Gita, or am I misrepresenting the language? That's a very tough one. Um, so, um... Prior to my being, you know, coming back to the NIH after days, I, I was a faculty at the uh, Tulane University School of Public Health and, uh, and was helping students with grants and stuff. And one of them wanted to apply to, uh, to the diversity supplement. And she wanted to use the, you know, the fact that she was a girl or a woman or a, a female and also that she came from a Hispanic background because one of the parents was Hispanic. And I think that that, that took a little bit of uh, talking back and forth with the university officials. So I think at the level of the university is who you should, you should direct this question to because you know, in, the, in, the, in the big scheme of things, a grant is awarded to the institute. And the Institute Grants Office is the one that has all their policies and, and things like that squared away. And they obviously have worked with the NIH and you know, they have this agreement. So I would first check with them rather than, because it's not very clear just looking at the FOA, you know, that I can just say, okay, this one is a, is a female. And, and so I consider her a minority and do it on my own. There, need, there needs to be some official. So, 
I, uh, what I did at the time was work, uh, ask the student to work with the uh, research administration office at the university to see what the university uh, uh, considered, you know, these sorts of things. And then they had to get the documentation. Yes, that one of the parents was Hispanic and therefore they qualify and so on and so forth. So it's at the level of the university that I would, I would say you should, you should tackle it. Um, at the program officer level, maybe we could talk to the office, you know, the Office of Extramural Policy, OEP, and see what they have to say, but they'd direct you back to the FOA anyway, so. At NIDDK, essentially, we, as, as Gita mentioned, we, we take what the institutions say, um, especially when it comes to different racial and ethnic groups, because it's recognized that underrepresentation can vary from setting to setting. So individuals from more ethnic groups that can be demonstrated convincingly to be underrepresented by the grantee institution should be encouraged to participate in this program. And a specific example of that is particularly if someone is from Laos or from the Philippines, there's an underrepresentation in many areas where institutions are. And so a strong argument can be made, clearly this individual is underrepresented and they wouldn't be considered as well, they're Asian, you know, like you see how it can, the institution can describe why this person's underrepresented. Yeah. Um, and so going to the institution, having, talking with your institution and saying, we need a letter to, to show with the data for our area, why this candidate is underrepresented if they're not in a nationally underrepresented group, that's the key. With regards to the question, uh, we, there's not official policy about LGBTQ um, plus status because we don't have the data. So if there's, if your institution has data, but then that's intrusive because then you're asking, hey, um, how, so I don't have an answer. That's what I'm getting. Great, thank you. And the next question is typically, how long is it from application submission until funding begins if the application's approved? Uh, within NIGMS, uh, I typically tell uh, applicants that it's a 12 to 16 week process um, from the time I receive it. Um, we start the review process until if it's funded, they receive an email from me stating that it's it's been approved. So at Fogarty, we, we ask for us applications to be submitted by June 1. So even if you submitted it in May uh, or, or last November, it'll still, you know, we'll go from, you know, June, between June and September is when we collect all the applications, review them. So I would say six months, but not less than six months, four months, July, August, September, two months, two and a half months. We have rolling review at NIDDK. So we, we, we lay out on our, our website when applications are due. So we encourage people to submit when they'll find out the fastest. So if you submit in the month of review slash paid plan, paid plan, plan, it's similar to GMS or NIGMS where it's about seven to eight weeks, basically two months between submission and funding and receipt of your NOGA or notice of award. Sorry. <laughs> it's like it's, just, H, it's a bad habit. We all do it. <laughs> oh, it's another language here. Oh, I like it. Um, and could someone speak a bit about what's covered with a diversity supplement? We cover um, salary support, some limited travel, and a small amount of supplies. And I think this is key to consider in terms of what the research plan is and how the research needs to be tangential or related to the already funded parent award because the maximum amount of research supply funding is around $10,000 and that's for a junior faculty. But for grad students and postdocs, we're talking in the range of three to $5,000 and it ranges at different ICs. But we pay NRSA and full overhead. So we pay the rate at which NIH says a graduate student and undergraduate and postdoc should make. Um, that we call that in our slang, NRSA funding. Um, and we pay the full indirect costs that your institution receives on government funded awards. Tom, did you want to ask the next one? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of scrolling through. There are a lot of, a lot of really good questions here. 
Um, I think um, it, what, one question um, is, uh, does Fogarty have other resources for funding permanent residents, funding people without permanent resident status? Uh, are there other mechanisms that we can use to fund uh, non-permanent residents? Non-permanent residents. Yeah, people who don't qualify for the diversity supplement. Right. Um, in, you mean in terms of supplements? Yes, we have the regular, all of NIH has the regular administrative supplements that you could apply, that the PI can apply for. Okay. So there, there is no, um, you know, there's no uh, diversity involvement at all. So a PI can apply for a supplement to work on us, you know, bring in a new person to work on any aspect of, you know, a supplement, just like the diversity, you just don't have those restrictions. I think that's an yeah. NIH wide administrative supplement program. Okay, okay. Um, we have about four minutes left. Um, uh, Sun, would you show, shall we wrap up? Sure, happy to. And again, um, Tom mentioned this already, but we're getting a lot of really great, great questions in the Q&A in the chat. And all of this is being recorded. And so we'll make sure to compile um, a Q&A <laughs> on our webpage, the UC Global Health Institute webpage, to have all of the responses to your, answer, to your questions. And so um, thank you again to our special guests, Rob and Shakira and Gita. Uh, this has been such a wonderful conversation to have with you and you're all so busy. So we feel very lucky and happy to see the turnout for everyone here. Um, so we wanted to just let everyone know that this is the first webinar of um, a series of webinars that the UC Global Health Institute will be hosting. And so our next one will be in May. Um, so stay tuned for details on that uh, at a future webinar, we do um, hope to have successful applicants of diversity supplements come and share some of their lessons learned and share a bit about their process. Um, is Tom, is there anything else you wanted to mention before we close? Just to say thank you to everybody who participated in this in this webinar. Uh, tell your friends, we will post it on our website. And we just think this is an incredibly important initiative. As Rob said in his introduction, diversity matters. It matters for a lot of different reasons. And historically excluded uh, individuals and groups have, we want to encourage historically, uh, uh, historically underrepresented groups to be able to participate in the scientific enterprise. And it improves the scientific enterprise. Diversity really helps creative thought. So we really appreciate your thinking about this and, and do hope we see lots of applications from people. I think we counted over 2,000 potential uh, grants at the University of California that would qualify for diversity supplements. And I'm sure it's an undercount. And we only have 60 granted last year. So we can do better. And we really, we really want, want to encourage this to happen. And I also wanted to mention, um, we'll be sending out a post-event survey via email. Uh, you'll have Rob's beautiful slides as well. And we'll send you a list of resources for everyone who is able to participate. I just want to say, don't hesitate to call your program office. So we are here to help you. Yes, and, or if oh, you're, you're shy up. about talking, I, I do get multiple emails a day and I'm, I respond to them usually within 24 hour turnaround. So um, I look forward to hearing from everyone who has a question. Yeah. I'm horrible on the phone, but I'm, <laughs> a, I'm an email person. So if you notice my Zoom says my, it has my email. So I've been trying to answer questions in the QA furiously. So I've answered 23, but there's still 68 and there's no way we're gonna answer all those. But if there's a burning question, you have my email, it's right there um, where we work for you. So help, help us help you, ask us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have Thank a good you. afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye, you too.